If you haven't done so yet, please pause the video and try to solve the question on your own before listening on. We'll notice that there is more than one battery in this circuit, and in that situation, when you have more than one battery, you're going to have to use Kirchhoff's rules. And to use Kirchhoff's rules, we have to draw currents in the circuit. For example, in this section of the circuit right here, we can arbitrarily draw a current that's flowing to the left. Notice that that current would be flowing through this entire portion of the circuit, and we can call that current I1. Now, there will be a different current flowing through this section of the circuit. Perhaps we can draw it pointing upward, and we can call that I2. In many cases, we don't actually know the direction of the current, so we sort of choose it randomly. And if it turns out to be wrong, then we can go back later and actually fix it. But for now, we're just going to assume that the current flowing through this portion of the circuit is flowing upward. Now, in this section of the circuit, we're going to have another current, and perhaps we can draw that flowing downward. There is a general tendency for current to flow away from the positive terminal of a battery, so if you're going to make your guess as to which direction to draw the current, it's probably a good idea to draw it moving away from the positive terminal. And then actually, if we look back here, we have the current flowing towards the negative terminal, and again, that's usually correct. So that's just something to keep in mind when guessing the directions of the currents. We can label this current I3, and then we're going to have another current flowing through this portion of the circuit. And we'll point it again towards the negative terminal, and we can call it I4. Now, after drawing the currents, we can apply the so-called junction rule which simply states that the total current flowing into a junction is equal to the total current flowing out of the junction. Consider this section of the circuit that we've colored in red. If we look carefully, we can see that currents 1 and 2 are emanating away from or out of that particular section of the circuit. So in the equation, we could include I1 in I2 as being part of the total current flowing out of the junction. On the other hand, current 3, if we look carefully, is flowing into the junction that's marked off by the red section. And so we would put that on the current flowing into the junction side of the equation. Current 4 might not be obvious, but if you sort of follow it back to the red portion of the circuit, you can see that current 4 would be moving away from or out of that junction. And so we would include that as well on the total current out of the junction. And so this is our first equation that we need in this problem. Now, since there are four unknowns, we're going to actually need a total of four equations, which means we need to generate three more equations. And to do that, we're going to have to look at the loop rule next. Now, to apply the loop rule, we actually have to pick a loop, of course. And to do that, we can perhaps pick an arbitrary point in the circuit, and we're going to move around a continuous loop through the circuit. So, for example, we could move our way through this loop indicated by the orange curve. And when we do that, we want to keep track of the potential changes. So, for example, when we pass through the 200 ohm resistor, we know that the potential change will equal whatever current is flowing through that resistor times the value of the resistance. Well, we can see that the resistance is 200 ohms. And the current that's flowing through the 200 ohm resistor has been labeled as I1. If you sort of follow I1 through the orange section of the circuit, you can see that it does indeed pass through this resistor. So we would have to put in I1 for that current. Furthermore, since we're moving with the direction of I1, it would actually be a negative potential change. And so that would be our first potential change. Now, we would continue our way through the circuit. We encounter this battery. We're moving from the positive to the negative terminal of the battery. That always represents a negative potential change. And the magnitude of that potential change would be this 40 volts. So we're going to have a minus 40 volts. Continuing along, we pass through the 80 ohm resistor. And this time, we're flowing with the, excuse me, we're flowing against the direction of the current. And when we flow against the current, that represents a positive potential change. And the amount of potential change will be the resistance times the current. So it will be 80 times I2. And then we continue our journey around the orange loop and return to where we started, and therefore we would set it equal to zero. So we'll take this equation and leave it on the side for use later. 
So we still need a couple more equations, and to do that, we'll pick a different loop. So if we go to the middle portion of the circuit, we can perhaps draw a loop that travels in this direction. And we can pick an arbitrary starting point, perhaps right here. And we're going to move the way, move our way through the loop. And when we encounter this battery, we're moving from the negative to the positive terminal. So that's actually going to be a positive potential change of 360 volts. Continuing our way through the blue loop, we are flowing with the current that's passing through this resistor. Again, with the current means a negative potential change. And the amount is the resistance of 20 times the current I3. We will then turn and come this way, and this time we're flowing with the current marked I2. So that's another negative potential change, and it's 80 times the current of I2. And then we encounter a battery moving from negative to positive terminal. That's a positive potential change, and the amount is 40 volts. And then we return to where we started and set it equal to zero. So this is our third equation. For the final equation, we're going to do something a little bit different. We're going to start at this point, but instead of going around this rightmost loop, we're actually going to go around the entire circuit itself, which of course constitutes a loop, a rather large loop, but one nonetheless. And we'll return to that point right there. So let's keep track of the potential changes. Moving from positive to negative terminal is a negative potential change of 80 volts. Then moving with the current of I4 is a positive potential change equal to 70 times I4. And then we'll keep going around the circuit. We're not encountering anything interesting until we hit this resistor where the current is I1 and we're moving with that current. So that's a negative potential change equal to 200 times I1. And then we go around the outside of the circuit and return to where we started. So we set this equal to zero. And this is our fourth equation. So at this point, the problem becomes a complex algebra situation. So we're going to clear up the workspace. So here are the four equations in the order that we determined them. We're going to leave the first equation alone. For the second equation, we're going to solve it for I2. And to do that, we would have to add the negative 200 I1 over to the right side as well as the 40 over to the right side. We would then divide each term by 80 so that we could isolate I2. Now this result for I2 we're going to hold on to and use in just a moment. For the third equation we're going to solve it for I3 and to do that let's add the 20 I3 over to the right side. Let's then divide each term by 20 so that we can isolate I3. And then we can add the 18 and the 2. So this result for I3 we're also going to hold on to. In the fourth equation we're going to solve for I4, so let's add the 80 to the right side and the 200 I1 to the right side. And then we'll divide each term by 70 in order to isolate I4. And this result for I4 we're going to hold on to. Now to solve this system what we're going to do is take this expression for I2 and we're going to substitute it into this spot right here. And we'll show the work up here since we're kind of running out of room. And after we distribute the minus 4 to both terms and simplify, and then of course collect like terms, we can see that I3 is equal to 18 minus 10 I1. Now what we're going to do next, and this is a little tricky, is we're going to take this expression for I3 and this expression for I2, and then this expression for I4, which you'll notice are all in terms of I1, and substitute them into the original equation that we generated. So you might want to pause the screen and just make sure it all makes sense here. This right here was the expression for I3. We left I1 alone, of course. This was the expression for I2 that we had generated, and this is the expression for I4. So now you have a, an equation that is in terms of a single variable I1, and that can, of course, be solved for. And when you do that, you should get 1.00 amps. And I realize I'm skipping a little bit of the algebra there, so if you have any questions about how that was solved, let me know in the comments. I'd be happy to show you how that was done. But now that we have I1, we can sort of backtrack and perhaps calculate I3, because I3 is just 18 minus 10 times I1. 
So here is that equation. We'll substitute one amp in for I1. And then we can see that I3 turns out to be eight amps. For I2, again, we're gonna substitute in the value that we discovered for I1. And so we're gonna end up with roughly three amps for I2. And then for I4, again, substituting in one amp, we get four amps for I4. So there are finally the three, excuse me, the four values of current that the question is asking for. Part B mercifully is much easier to get the potential difference across the 200 ohm resistor. We just have to remember that potential difference is equal to the current flowing through that resistor multiplied by the resistance. We recall from our earlier drawing that the current that's flowing through the 200 ohm resistor was marked as I1. And of course we now have the value of I1. So we substitute in that value for the current and then the resistance is given to us as 200 ohms. So we can see that the potential difference across that resistor is just going to end up being 200 volts, which is indeed the correct answer to part B. Thanks very much for taking the time to watch that rather lengthy video. I hope you liked it. If you did so, please click the thumbs up icon and also subscribe to the channel. Remember, you can send in your own question to this email address and I'll do my best to answer it on YouTube.